Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipperer, the club's vice president of media and editorial and Michelle's co-host for this program. We hope you're staying safe and are well wherever you are. We have produced more than 550 online programs since the beginning of the pandemic and will continue to live stream programs to the world. But we're excited that we have begun announcing our first in-person programs in more than a year, including on July 1st, when Michelle and I will be back with our first in-person program featuring TikTok star Nick Cho, whose millions of followers know him as Your Korean Dad. So head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all upcoming programs, plus podcasts and video from past events. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any views expressed are those of the speakers. Now, if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box, to submit some questions for our special guest today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of the Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John. And thank you everyone for joining us for this great program during Pride Month. And yes, we can't wait to see you if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, July 1st for Nick Cho, your Korean dad. Our guest today, well, uh, a recent profile or description on GQ British, British GQ, I should say, uh, dubbed him the coolest man in Britain. So I feel really cool to have him here with us. He began his career as a model. He's also a writer, a style and fashion commentator, and the founder of the Queer Bible Online, soon to be podcast, and now this book that we're going to talk about. So let's welcome Jack Guinness to the program. Jack, thanks so much for making time to be with us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me, Michelle. And thank you, John. It's lovely to be here. So the Queer Bible began as an online community of people sharing the work and joy of our global LGBTQ community. And now it's a book with LGBTQ voices, but big voices like celebrity voices as well, who share these love letters to their heroes. Now your hero is RuPaul, whom you said was kind of the inspiration behind the Queer Bible. Share more about that. Yeah, um, so I think RuPaul is a lot of people's heroes, first and foremost. I can't claim any dibs on RuPaul whatsoever. Um, but I've noticed uh, watching the early seasons of Drag Race that there were so many um, catchphrases and quotes and references that I didn't know. And you knew that they were from something iconic. And so I'd Google them frantically and try and work out. And I realized that I was missing those maybe elders or those... Um, drag mothers that could in, in initiate me into the ways of queer culture. So I wanted to create an online resource selfishly just for myself, somewhere that I could go and I could learn these references. I could learn about my um, queer ancestry. And when I looked online, there were a lot of amazing resources, but some of them were quite academic looking. Some of them looked like they were made in the nineties in comic book sands with clip art and, like kind of purple font. And I was like, wait a minute, LGBTQ plus people are supposed to be the most fabulous, brilliant, creative people ever. We need a site that reflects that. So that's how the website started. I ask my heroes to write an essay about theirs. And then I get an illustrator to do a beautiful original illustration. And that's how the website began. And did you know all or most of these people beforehand that you asked to write or? No, that's a great question, John. So I... My biggest thing is I ask people to write about their hero. So I have my ideas about who I want to cover, but that never works out. The best person is always the person that they want to write about. So sometimes someone will suggest someone that I've never heard of, or I don't maybe think is right. And then they write this essay and it's all about the moments where you realize who you are, where you find that hero that either shows you who you can be or turns on a light inside you. And so it's these formative moments in people's lives. So the essays are always about quite a big moment in someone's life. And so they're, they're intensely personal. 
I describe it as a kind of buy one, get one free because you have the narrative of the writer, but then you also have the, the story of the person that they're writing about. So a great example was I, I wanted a piece um, on, uh, well, I basically tracked down a guy called David Crowland, who was one of Robert Maplethorpe's exes. And he wrote an essay about the day he went to the Chelsea Hotel. He met a young guy called Robert Maplethorpe and his girlfriend called Patty Smith. And he steals Robert Maplethorpe off Patty Smith. So if you're a young kid that doesn't know anything about Robert Maplethorpe, you've got this really juicy story. You're like, oh my God, this is so rock and roll. I want to learn more about this. And if you do know who Robert Maplethorpe is, you have this kind of untold tale that is see, makes you see him in a new light. So I think the... The experience I want the readers of the of the website and now the book to have is is kind of as a starting point to inspire them to maybe turn them on to someone they didn't know about and then they can go off and watch the movies themselves, listen to the music, read the novels. Or as as with one of the cases in, in the book, there's a brilliant, beautiful essay about George Michael. And it's a case of taking someone we all think we know and we think we understand and seeing them in a completely new light. And that was really exciting to me, getting to know new people that I'd never heard of. You know, I come here very humbly to learn, but also to maybe see those queer icons that, not that we've written off, but maybe we we neatly pack away and think, oh, I, I know, I understand them, I've got them. And then when you see them through someone else's eyes, you kind of see them for the first time. I want to back up just a little bit. I'm curious about the title or calling the entire project the Queer Bible. I mean, the Bible has, so for some of us, some you know negative feelings, um, but at the same time, calling the entire project the Queer Bible is one on one hand radical, on the other hand, spiritual in a lot of ways. I'd love to hear kind of how you decided to call it the Queer Bible. Michelle, that is the most nuanced, lovely interpretation of what I've done and I want to write that down and I want to put it on t-shirts and I want to I want you to come with me when I have to do interviews so you can say that for me before I start talking that was so beautifully put um you're completely correct for a lot of LGBTQ plus people religion organized religion specifically the church and the, the Christian church the Catholic church and the Protestant church has been a real source of pain for for many of us um also there are a lot of LGBTQ plus people who are religious and who are spiritual and have a faith and maybe have found their own church or maybe they've been excluded from that. I come to this project, uh, the child of a vicar. So my dad's a priest. Um, so in like four weddings and a funeral, he's got the, the white dog collar on. He looks like a proper like Dickensian character, really old fashioned kind of Victorian Church of England vibes. And so I grew up loving my religious family but also having a difficult relationship with them and trying to marry together my identity as a gay guy with my upbringing and my spirituality and my love of my family. So there is something a little bit subversive about calling it the queer Bible. There's something a little bit maybe problematic for some people about that, but I don't mind that. And I think if that starts conversations that we can talk about, talk about religion, talk about sexuality, talk about gender, talk about our experiences of the church. Hopefully that will be a healing conversation that we can have. And through my relationships with my family and my relationships with a lot of the religious people that I knew growing up with, I have really worked at, and they have too, coming to a place of understanding and maybe not complete mutual agreement on everything, but loving each other through the difficulty and and sometimes the yeah the pain of those relationships so yeah calling it the queer bible is is a bit naughty i also wanted to give a gift to lgbtq plus people because i think for so long we've been excluded from the official narratives these big books have deleted us or well, maybe they've kept some of the facts about us but removed our the complexities of our sexuality of our gender of our identities so we've been erased really from the history books or lgbtq plus people who have been here in in the world in indigenous cultures for thousands of years have maybe had to hide who they are for their own safety so the queer bible project is one about bringing those stories out into the light so they can be celebrated and, and heard and also putting them into a physical book 
is quite powerful. You know, this this book might go in libraries. This book might go in school libraries. This will be in pu- permanent collections. And there's something powerful about our history, or just a tiny bit of our history. You know, this is by no means representative or exhaustive. But there's having some of our stories collected together in a physical book that weighs something that you can hold, that you can give to someone as a precious item. To me, that's quite a magical, power, powerful thing. As someone that loves books, I'm excited to see us in a in a bound volume called the Queer Bible. It's great. It's interesting you get into the the book aspect of the book because one of your writers is talking about uh, Barnes and Noble, the bookstore chain, and how that is that was like the one place in, in, I forget if it was a man or woman writing this, but it was the one place in there. It's Mickey Blanco, um, who's they, them. Okay. And, and, and how the, in a way, and I, I in fact, uh, who was her name? Christy Hefner made this point too, at one point, We're talking about borders and Barnes and Nobles and that in a lot of smaller communities, those are the only places where a kid might go and, and, find gay literature, find, you know, stuff outside of what, what could be sometimes a kind of stifling conservative uh, environment. Absolutely. Um, so. I think um, it, before the internet, we had to search out, we had to find each other, which was great because it meant that the clubs were underground and they were a bit more exciting and dangerous in a good way. But for me, I remember going to America for the first time and desperately going to Tower Records and trying to find DVDs by like queer filmmakers like Greg Araki and people like that. And then I had like my copy and it was the wrong region to work on my DVD player. And it was like, it was really hard to find queer culture. Um, you had to seek it out. And I remember going to Borders in, in America, it was Barnes and Noble in Union Square and finding gay literature when I was relatively young. And then in in London, here in London where I live and grew up, there was a big bookshop called Foils. And I went and did my book signing of the Queer Bible there today. Um, we just published today. And I called my sister before and I was really emotional. And I didn't know why, because it was I was really emotional, like ridiculously more than I am normally. And I'm quite dramatic. And she said to me, Jack, do you know why you're freaking out? And I said, no. And she said, because when you were like 12, 13, you used to go and sit in this bookshop foils, which is like, you've been around for hundreds of years. You'd go and sit in there for like six hours at a time with piles of magazines, with the books. And that was, I didn't have the money to buy them, but that's where I was reading all this queer literature. And she was like, so now you're returning to this place as a writer, signing your own book that you're now gonna share with other queer kids that are gonna come and sit in there for six hours. And I I don't mind if they don't buy it, they can leaf through it for hours (laughs) on end. But yeah, I love that. The, The book space, the bookshops is a space for queer kids all around the world to go and go and find out about queer culture. That's a lovely thing. So some of the uh, contributors here, and I'll just bring it up. I mean, I was so ecstatic to hear David Furnish's hero, Sylvester. I mean, Sylvester is God here in the San Francisco Bay area. Um, And uh, also Sir Elton John, of course. And so I'm curious to find out like it, I mean, just by the way they were writing, it almost felt like they were, writing for a project of of friends it felt like you are close to sir elton john and david furnish um but yeah how did they get involved in the project firstly i must just say san francisco has a real presence in this book the queer bible um i didn't know about sylvester's performances i didn't know about sylvester doing that amazing gig bringing the city together and mixing the queer community with the kind of opera crowd. I I had no idea about that part of Sylvester's incredible career. So, you know, actually, and then then also Graham Norton's essay on on Armistead Maupin is incredible, all about tales of the city. And then in, in, I've, I've, with an amazing artist called Alex Fairbrother Naylor, we created city maps. And in the middle is a, is a map of the world with some of the queer history. And then we did a map for San Francisco and a map for New York. And the map of San Francisco is fascinating. So it's, I'm really honored to be talking to you, to you both and talking to being a little part of the San Francisco community. It's a lovely moment for me. Um, but yeah, going to your <laughs> question about David and Elton, I, through my work in fashion, I'd 
met David first. He works with the British Fashion Council, and so do I here in London. Um, and then I briefly met Elton. And the first time you meet Elton, you don't really meet Elton. You're near Elton and you have a panic attack and then you have to go away and hide somewhere and calm down. That's how you meet Elton for the first time. And then the second time, maybe you get one word out and then you say something stupid and then you run away again and have another panic attack. So after about four meetings with Elton, you get a vague semblance of a conversation. And um, I had some funny meetings with Elton and I just just launched straight in and was quite fearless and brave and tried to make Elton laugh. And he really is one of, he's just how you want him to be. Like I've met quite, I've been very, very fortunate. And I've met a few people that were my heroes over the years. And more often than not, they're rubbish. Like they're really just such a disappointment. And Elton is everything you want him to be and more. And the thing about him that really surprised me is he kind of has almost deliberately built this reputation as a kind of like, you know, like this rock and roll larger than life character and 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 he and that's in his clothes that's in his videos that's in everything you know he that's something he cultivates he has this stage persona but what i wasn't expecting about sir elton as i should as i should quite rightly refer to him is his tenderness and his kindness and his gentleness and his generosity and he's been so generous with me with this project and i i remember having a one of my early phone calls with him and he kept referring to me as my darling boy he said oh my darling boy my darling boy and it was like that kind of role model that you never had that you wished you could being so kind and lovely to you it was one of the most healing affirming conversations i've ever had in my life you know for him he was just on the phone to some guy but i was sat there almost in floods of tears being like oh i've been anointed by my fairy godmother um so yeah, and, and also the work that he's done with Elton John AIDS Foundation and, and the work that David Furnish does um, as a couple is incredible. You know, they really genuinely care. And talking to him um, about being in the midst of the AIDS epidemic and the trauma um, that, that that was for, for the whole global queer community and then on an individual personal level is very, very moving. He really cares and he really engages with the pain of our community and he talks about it in a way that helps people like me that, that were children then and didn't live through it properly emotionally really understand it and he couldn't be more supportive of you know shows like pose and the actors in them and it's a sin you know he really believes in the power of culture and storytelling to change hearts and minds and then potentially save lives um and so in his essay about divine it's very funny i mean i don't want to spoil it but he tells a shocking story about going clubbing with divine that you just have to read the essay i'm not going to spoil the punchline but it's shocking and then he moves on to talking about um losing divi as as he calls divine um not to aids but at the height of of the aids epidemic and so that loss of that close personal friend of his is so tied up in 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 the loss of so many young people um, so it's a very funny essay. It's a very honest, raw essay, um, and it's very moving. So yeah, that is, I my life will never be the same, and that's because of the involvement of Elton John and David Furnish in the Queer Bible Project. You, you mentioned earlier about how you, in these essays, you you learn both about the person they're describing and talking about, but also about the writer themselves, and often we we, we see kind of their coming out story. So I'm going to ask you the question that Michelle usually asks uh, all of her guests, which is, tell us your coming out story. When did you know, oh my God, I'm gay. That's what this means. Or how did do you come out to this, this family, this religious family and such? Sure. I mean, I, that's a, a great question. It's a big question. It's a, it's a question really of, of when did I realize the entirety of who I am and be okay with that, really? That's what that question's about, isn't it? And I think for me and for many queer people, it's a process of understanding and developing our relationship with ourselves about our sexuality and our gender. And it should be an ever growing thing. You know, the thing I find annoying about coming out is having to repeatedly do it to loads of different people in loads of different ways. And I think straight people have no idea about that, um, about, you know, the constant decisions you make in every work situation you're in, every social situation you're in, and it helps that I, you know, after a drink, I get very uh, effeminate 
and camp because then it instantly answers, oh, you know, I don't have to do any telling. Uh, telling of, uh, I'm gay. It's like I'm flouncing in, dancing about. I'm clearly, I'm clearly a brilliantly gay homosexual. Um, with my friends, I think I came out really quite young and I, I think there was no moment where I carried around a secret. There's some, there's some essays in the book. The Gus Kenworthy, the Olympian, talks a lot about knowing privately before sharing it and the weight of that and the damage that that does to you. For me, I think I kind of worked out who I was in, in conversation with my friends. And then I waited a long time to come out to my parents and that was very difficult. And not coming out to them was definitely to the detriment of my mental health. And it was something very difficult. I really advise young people. Um, I interviewed Sir Ian McKellen, actually, for the upcoming Queer Bible podcast. And he is such a legend. And he said that, you know, you mustn't come out for anyone but yourself. You must only come out when it's physically and emotionally safe for you to do so. And I think there's such an emphasis on coming out in our community. We always, you know, coming out day, how did you come out? And I, and I think that puts a lot of pressure on young people to, to come out. And I would say that, you, you know, you only need to do it when you're ready um, and when it's safe to. But, um, so Ian McKellen said, when he came out, he became a better actor. He became a better far, um, um, brother. He became a better son. And every single bit of his life became better. And he's met more gay people than I'll ever meet in my lifetime through all his different amazing charity work. And he said he's never met anyone that regrets coming out. So that's definitely my experience. It was really tough. It was really difficult. It took longer than, than maybe it, it should have done or could have done. But by the time I did it, I was so happy that I did. And I fundamentally believe that the truth is a positive thing. Being honest is always good. It can be painful, it can be messy, but it's fundamentally good. So for me, even though there was a huge amount of pain and trauma surrounding coming out, now I'm through that and on the other side, I'm living in a place of truth, which is so good for my mental health and it's good for the mental health of everyone around me. I just realized that's quite a heavy <laughs> coming out story most people are probably like i made a cake <laughs> i was like oh mine was very traumatic mine was very dramatic <laughs> i always enjoy hearing you know coming out stories and a lot of it i think is because it's therapy but also because i'm learning something new all the time and i forget who said it but there is someone out there who says it's actually a gift to be lgbtq uh, having done so many interviews and have spoken to so many different people of our community, what are some of the things that you've learned? Wow, that's such a, you're asking me such interesting questions. These are like the best questions I've been asked. I've learned, I've learned ugh, anything useful I, I know in my life is from the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I've learned that sometimes the world can punish you and make you suffer for being who you are. And that the bravest of us are ourselves in spite of that. And I witness, especially my friends that are challenging gender norms and are non-binary and trans, I look at the paths that they walk and how bravely and brilliantly and like generously they live their lives. And I look at them and I'm just, constantly inspired and I draw strength from them and I now want to do everything I can to protect them and elevate them and shine my light on them um I learned I ran away to New York when I was kind of like a late teenager and I really fell into the drag scene there um and I had lots of incredible friends and I learned probably the camaraderie you get when you're in a group of people that are maybe pushed to the outside of society. So maybe something that other people would maybe look down on is a strength that I saw. And I saw the, the depth of relationships you can have with your chosen family. Um, and, 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 and I love my family, my biological family. I have a great relationship with them. But as someone that had had a very tough time relating to them, being welcomed into a queer family 
was such a healing, incredible experience. And then just having people accepting you and loving you, not in spite of who you are, but because of who you are and all the things that you think are weird and awful about you are actually the best thing about you. That's probably the gift that the, the queer community have, have given me and continue to give me. Like I'm, I come to this whole Queer Bible project so humbly, like I'm the stupidest person I know. I wanna learn everyone's stories. I want, I, I just, I'm, I'm here like a reader and I'm constantly inspired and um, expanded by my relationships in the queer community. You, you mentioned earlier, you were talking about Alta John and, and Divine. And, uh, and I, I think um, in that essay, he actually was writing about how um, the the persona that they play on stage is, is or in, in in a film is very different from their personal lives, which tend to be quieter and and for lack of a better term, more normal. But um, it, it it I I just kind of found it interesting that so many of the 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 writers are talking about finding their authentic selves and accepting that, and yet the heroes who helped them do that are often a performance. And that's not a contradiction. So I just kind of wanted to get your take on that, that and that's, the roles that that's that is That's a fascinating so take. So it's weird. So the people that help them find the deeper, truer version of themselves, maybe even like the healthier version of themselves, for want of a better word, are often the glamorous <laughs> performers. So there is, that does feel like a contradiction. Um, I've definitely found that in my life. I talk in my essay when I'm talking about RuPaul about how I've noticed RuPaul started out as a kind of gender queer performer that was quite punk, but really presented as a man and then almost accidentally fell into drag through performance, then had a career as a drag queen because the universe and the world were saying, no, we want you like this. So RuPaul gave everyone what they wanted and boy, did he give it to us. And then at one point he said, you know, actually I want to start also performing as RuPaul, not in track. And now ironically, he's kind of come full circle and he's able to do both and be accepted maybe without the glamour and the sheen and the makeup and the hair. Maybe there is, I'm not saying that, that drag is inauthentic. I think sometimes drag reveals the truest part of ourselves. Oh, whoever does it, whatever gender you are or, or sex you are when you do it. But there is something about that journey that RuPaul's been on. And I definitely noticed that in my career, when I was a model, I was really told that I needed to perform a very narrow type of masculinity, a really performative, like stupid, narrow part of, this is a man. And that was really damaging to me. And so I kind of, I write in my essay in the Queer Bible about how I was almost doing drag, but like bad drag. I was doing the damaging kind of drag. I was doing the drag that straight men are told to do. Hide your feelings, walk a certain way, be this kind of narrow type of guy. And for me, my queer journey, weirdly, has been taking off that drag, just as RuPaul's taken off that drag, and allowed me to be a more complex man, gay man. Um, I am a very privileged white cis gay man, um, but I'm also now being able to explore the the complexity of, of that identity and I don't have to perform this very narrow type. So there's an example of me finding my deeper, more authentic, fully queer, complex, messy self through the most glamorous human being on the planet, which is RuPaul. So yeah, I think what you're saying is completely right and possible. One of the things that I truly appreciate about the Queer Bible, and it's written in your foreword, is just how honest you are and the contributors of uh, acknowledging the contributions of queer people of color in our movement. And so, you know, you've got, like I mentioned earlier, David Furnish talking about Sylvester, but also Monroe Bergdorf on uh, uh, Paris is Burning and talking about the underground, the ballroom culture and in we all owe it to black queer people. Um, but, you know, I, I just really, really appreciate you being so honest and also acknowledging the contributions without questioning it or without trying to revise it. And so we'd love for you to speak a little bit more about including essays that were authentic in this way. Um, that's the best, most generous compliment I've had of the book. Um, 
Thank you so much for saying that. I This project really is not about me. I know I've rabbited on loads and talked loads about myself. This book is not about me. I'm not trying to center myself. I'm trying to use my tiny little platform to elevate the stories of other people. And they're telling their stories in their own voices and their own experiences in their own voices. And I don't know what it is to walk in their shoes. And I'm here just to listen and learn and celebrate the differences between us and celebrate the bits where we intersect, the bits that we have in common. I, some of the essays in here are really challenging and beautiful to me when they talk, they, they do talk about race and they talk about the legacy um, of black and brown people in our community, especially the trans members of our community that have gone before us and fought for our rights um, and fought for my rights. I, Monroe Bergdorf's essay on Paris is Burning is like magic. It's like a spell to me. The words are so powerful. It's all about the power of naming yourself, the power of your name, of your legacy. And it ends with Monroe, she, she lists the names of the different kids of the different houses. And she asks you to say them out loud with her. And you, you, you can whisper them, you can speak them, but there's such power in just calling out their names and just give, like giving them their props, basically giving them their due. Um, there's another essay by a brilliant writer and academic um, called Paula Akpan, and she writes about British black lesbians and the British black lesbian movement. And we talked a lot, a lot about whether she wanted to focus in on one individual and whether it was potentially even problematic to use such an umbrella term for a group of so many different people with different points of view and opinions. And the reason why we ended up going down that road, she really wanted to. And the reason was that there's hardly any literature, academic research about a huge part of our British queer community and she wanted to do an essay that really explored that and really um and really shone a light on those women and the work that they that they did for the lgbtq plus community here in the uk so thank you very much for for realizing that and and it's it's something that i i hope to do more volumes of the queer bible and i want to make sure that we um we're connecting to and reaching as many different parts of our community as possible as the project goes on and just let people tell their own stories in their own voices. And it's an honor to, to be part of the project and, and share those stories. Before we get too much further, you mentioned you're, you're launching a podcast and, and also it could be future editions of the book. Where could people go online if they want to get everything yes. about Jack? Dana so, and so at Queer Bible on Instagram, we do brilliant takeovers where we get amazing queer artists from all around the world to showcase specific projects that they've done. We delve, we go back right back in history. We have people that are working right now around the world, and that's really exciting. Um, and then if you search in any anywhere you get your podcasts, um, the Queer Bible podcast is coming soon, and there's a really fun um, queer meditation that I've created as the trailer. And you can hear snippets of interviews with some of the contributors from the book, like Monroe Bergdorf and Paris Lees. And you can also hear um, a snippet from the icon that is Sir Ian McKellen. Um, now I'm older than both of you, but when I was growing up, when I was in grade school in the 1970s, um, the first person yeah, I you know, ever saw that, okay, that person is gay, was a character on a TV show called All in the Family. And this was, at the time, it was huge, right? It was a gay character, this bigoted Archie Bunker, of course, didn't like him. He eventually came to really regret it when the guy was killed. But um, I'm just curious, who, when you were young, who was the first visible person to you that you realized, oh, that person is LGBTQ of, of whatever uh, identification and was it a positive or a negative impression? I um, was reading James Baldwin. He was talking about how we know before we know, and that you maybe know that there's something off, different, strange about yourself. And then you maybe sense that in someone else and you don't really know what that is. You don't name it as, as gay or queer. I remember 
not even knowing who or what RuPaul was when I saw RuPaul in the music video, weirdly, with Elton John. And if I think about the fact that that was the first thing I saw and now they're both in my book, that freaks me out. Um, but they did a single of uh, Don't Go Breaking My Heart. And I watched that video when I was really young. And I knew that RuPaul wasn't just a man or just a woman. I knew that RuPaul was like something different and more. But I obviously didn't have the vocabulary because I was like a stupid little kid. Um, and then another one was George Michael. And I just, this is before he came out, but I just knew. I mean, what guy gets all those supermodels in a music video and wears those tight jeans? Like, I smelt a rat. I knew something was up with old Georgie. Um, so those are probably the people that I knew and that felt like they lit a fire in me. Like, I felt, oh, this is a bit naughty. Like, I know. <laughs> There, there's something we have in common. But then there was a song, which was Bronsky Beat, um, Small Town Boy. Do you know that song? Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant song. It really sounds of England and London in the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s. And the lyrics of that are all about a boy going on a train and his mother doesn't understand why he has to leave and he's crying on a train. And the melancholy and the tragedy and the, the drama of that definitely chimed with me when I was a, a little a little budding queer kid. <laughs> it's funny. I actually thought all the um, actors who starred in Tu Wong Fu uh, yes. were, were gay. <laughs> but, you know, and, and that includes Wes Wesley Snipes. But uh, I would say, yes, George Michael, too, was one. But you know what's funny is we grew up watching soaps, my sisters and I. And um, when my straight sister found out that Ricky Martin um, is gay. She's so devastated. And, and, and part of us were like, no way. And then no, was, Ricky. Was R R Rico or something like that. I was like, Rico's not gay. Um, anyway. I love it when, no, Michelle, I really love it when people find out that a famous person's gay. And you're like, well, you didn't stand a chance with them anyway. Like, gay or straight. Like, sis, what are you on about? Like, <laughs> you didn't stand a chance. <laughs> love that oh my gosh that's a great point um one of the questions that i wanted to ask you was you know it's it's interesting to also hear stories or essays from folks from a part particular time and there there's a lot of us who are still scarred from the aids pandemic and then i feel like the young or the youth of our our community the younger generations understand the scars and at the same time are still kind of experiencing some of the remnants of our pain from the AIDS epidemic. I'd love to hear from you after hearing, you know, and reading all of these essays, if you felt the same, like when I went from uh, Sir Elton John to even Gus Kenworthy talking about Adam Rippon and this hope right? This great big positivity of having, you know, a gay medalist uh, or Olympic medalist and this hope that we can, we one day don't have to, like you said earlier, uh, feel the pain of being LGBTQ. There's also still part of it where, you know, we just never forget. Absolutely. Um, David Furnish's essay really talks about that. He talks about the post-traumatic stress that he's still has and that no matter how successful he gets he describes it in his essay really heartbreakingly as a trap door that he feels underneath him that could open at any minute this idea that none of this is real none of this is permanent everything can just get snatched away from you i grew up i was i, was, I think i was born in in the year that the first case was public so i grew up in the veil of it in the shadow of it and for me being gay meant death in my mind. That's what was associated in my head. And that it was just terrifying. And thinking that you might be gay was so scary because of that, because of what the press really did, what the press did in our minds. And I think about the generation, you know, before I was talking about why I started the project, because I felt like I didn't have that drag mother or I didn't have those elder gays around me. I think we lost a generation that would have done that for the next generation. We lost so many people 
that would have taught us all about the history and passed on the stories and the in-jokes and the fun and the joy of being queer. We lost so many of those people. And I don't get it. I, 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 I can hear about it and I find it really hard to connect up to it and imagine it. Um, the only way I've ever got close is through, through culture. It's through seeing plays like um, Lopez's The Inheritance. Um, it's through watching shows like Pose. Um, and it's through reading stories and it's hearing what it was really like for people. Like, what did you go through? Like, tell us, like, what was it like? All those amazing women that nurse those men, like their stories need to be told. We need to hear those stories. That's why when we have shows like It's a Sin and they really connect to the, not my generation, I'm, I'm older. I'm talking about the kids. When they get to really see it and live it and connect to it and realize what we went through as a community, what we lost and what we also held on to, and what survived and what their legacy is. I think that's really empowering for them to realize where they're from. I think the queer Bible really has taught me, if I sum it up, is when you realize you're LGBTQ+, you instantly feel separated from the people you're supposed to feel closest to. You feel separated from your family, you feel separated from your friends. And I think the most powerful thing for any marginalized group is to connect up to their history. It's to realize that you're not the first of your kind. You're not even the best of your kind. There are these incredible people that went before you that paved the way for you. And hearing these stories, I want young people and old people like myself, I want everyone to learn that, that we are, we're not just to survive, but we're to thrive knowing that we're walking in the footsteps of the most fabulous, beautiful, incredible people that have ever walked the face of the planet. Um, and that's what I really want young people to connect up with. It's interesting to be talking about the AIDS uh, uh, epidemic, pandemic, whatever, at a time when we're slowly coming out of this, this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And I don't know if it was as much in the UK, but here in the United States through much of 2020, when the government was, either ignoring or completely inept in dealing with this, totally living in denial about it, you know, not even doing some basic things to get to protect people, um, you know, rampant misinformation, et cetera. A lot of people were drawing connections. And, and of course, a lot of gay people were standing up and saying, yeah, see, this is, this is what we went through in the 1980s. Um, I'm going to take that in a bit of a different direction, though, because before the program, you and I were talking about what it's like to be doing this during a pandemic and uh, talk a bit, of, if you will, both what you're going through, how your pandemic was, mm. um, but also what you think it, it has been like and, and what you know it has been like for, say, the young LGBTQ person who maybe spent much of the last year not in school um, you know, at home, which might've been happy and might not have been happy, but I mean, how that might have, have uh, sure. affected their development. Sure. Well, I think the parallels are huge. I think the saddest difference is that when people finally did care or get it, the seriousness of it, things were done very, very quickly. We have a vaccine in like a year. People are getting vaccinated, which is brilliant, but that didn't happen with, in the AIDS epidemic. No one cared. People were throwing their loved ones' ashes on the lawn of the White House and nothing changed. So as, as much as there are parallels, it's interesting what happens when there's a virus that affects everyone, uh, including straight, powerful white people, how quickly, suddenly, miraculously, we managed to get a vaccine for that. But for HIV and AIDS, we're, we have incredible medical advances and we can have normal lives now, but there's, there was no quick fix, easy vaccine within a year. So I think that's really important to note. Um, kids, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be a kid during this. I mean, it was weird for me. I'm very privileged, I'm very lucky, but I didn't, all my work stopped, all my income stopped. I, I was isolated in my flat, that's an English for apartment. And if I um, had, didn't have the book, I would have really lost it even more than I did. I found it really, really tough. But the book kept me going. The book kept me through. So I'm, <laughs> you know, I have like Stockholm Syndrome for this book. I'm like, you saved my life. Um, but when I think about the kids, I just, when I think about all queer people, it's like, we have a chosen family. We need to be with them. And I noticed in London, 
by definition, a lot of the queer spaces are basements because either they were underground in the beginning and no one was allowed to know about them, or they were deliberately kept like that to keep the queer people in them safe from the people outside. They're not big outside spaces. So when we have slowly started to reopen in London, the last places to properly open, so a lot of them haven't still, is those queer underground basement dance clubs and bars and the you know, they're my favourite places to to be. And so we've been kept apart from each other. So I feel that queer people have really suffered um, really particularly badly because we've been denied those spaces that we can go to and be safe. I mean, everywhere is a straight space, like everywhere is. We need those really specific places. Um, and, and, And I'm really worried about them. And I think my big call to LGBTQ plus people is get off the apps and get back out there and support your local bars, your clubs, support your, your local drag queen. I love that phrase. And we really need to go out there and show up. And if there's a gay or an LGBTQ plus owned restaurant or business, we need to go and support those and, and, and make sure that they come out through, of the pandemic um, whole. I'm really, really passionate about that. So I'm going to be out drinking every night of the week for my community. <laughs> I had that same thought in mind. And then after day three, I was like, I need to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> the community will be fine. I'm just going to have a night off. Yeah, I t- wholeheartedly agree with you. And actually, we have a program coming up um, on Monday, you know, on mental health and resilience and recovery of the pandemic and how it has affected the LGBTQ youth uh, uh, community. Um, but Jack, you know, I can see version two or the second edition or third edition, fourth, fifth, sixth, millionth edition of the queer Bible. This can go on and on and on forever, but let's uh, do baby steps and think about the second edition and maybe uh, who are some voices that you're thinking about or that you might be planning. I don't know if you're planning, but even if it's just a wish list, what other voices out there of the queer community would you want to share? Sure, I really, I'd love to have more bisexual voices in there. I'd love to have more intersex and asexual voices. We have a brilliant essay um, by Hannah Gabby Odielli about um, their intersex experience, which is just fascinating and inspiring and joyous and brilliant. And there's so many lessons in that for everyone. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to make sure that, that more parts of our community are given the platform to tell their their stories and their voices and no one person can kind of explain what it's like to be a whole you know like no one gay man can explain what it's like to be all gay men so you know there is that limitless potential I definitely have my wish list of of activists that I would like to be in the book we have Lady Phil in this in in this queer bible who's the founder of UK Black Pride and runs Kaleidoscope which is a charity that fights for the rights of global LGBTQ plus people and especially refugees and that's incredible and I'd like to make sure that we're telling more global queer stories especially from countries that have really repressive um legal protections for LGBTQ plus people. I think we're in such a privileged bubble in our communities. Like you're you're out in kind of the West Coast, I'm in London. Trans people especially have a, are having a really tough time all around the world. But I think it's really important, especially for like white cis gay men like me to really check our privilege and realize that there are people around the world now who's like who are being murdered who live in daily threats of violence and i'd love to share some of those stories not as a kind of like a oh how tragic but like to celebrate like the the, the lives being lived around the world and and the joy and the pain of, of of that so yeah there's so many more stories to tell i'm just like i'm here i, I just want to learn you can hear how in my voice i just i just want to hear all the stories i don't want to share all the stories um so yeah we were talking before about how the lineup of of the contributors is like the dream dinner party that you could ever go to. And that's the feeling I get. I'm like, I want more. I, I want more parties. Um, have you heard, I mean, you, you're, the book just was released in the US uh, two days ago. Today, it's the first day of release in the UK. But have you heard from or do you expect to hear from any of the subjects of these articles and what reactions they might have? Wow. Um, I really hope they're really flattered. 
I know that the essays are so heartfelt and personal, but there's not one essay I could think anyone would have a problem with. I think they'll all be positive, but you know, you never know. Um, I talked to Edward Enenfull, who is the editor of British Vogue, and he's the first black man to be appointed to that such a senior role within Condé Nast. And I spoke to him. He knew, he knew Paris Lees, who's a brilliant writer, was going to be writing her piece about him. And he was very excited and he begged me to show him the beautiful illustration um, portrait, which has been done by a brilliant artist called Alex Ming. Um, and I refused to show it to him. And I said, you're going to have to just wait till the book comes out. So there will be some fun surprises. And I look forward to hearing from all the contributors. Hopefully they'll be honoured as, as I'm honoured that, that they've allowed me to have them in the book. You briefly mentioned it in the beginning and just now, um, but the illustrations also that are part of the book are incredible. I mean, you know, some of them are Picasso-esque. And uh, um, so, but you had mentioned that there's a group of contributors who did the artwork for the book. Can you talk about, you know, how you pulled all the folks together and going this direction and uh, making, making the book what it is? Absolutely. It's really important to me. We talked about the preciousness of the, of, of the book. I wanted it to feel like you wanted to own it, like you wanted to have it. It, it, it couldn't just live on like be a, be a blog post like the website. And the illustrations really feel like they are each individual art pieces. And thank goodness for social media, because I was able to find a really rich, diverse roster of artists. So they're mainly LGBTQ+. There are a few ally artists who are like the most supportive uh, they could possibly be of our community. And I'm really, really happy that they agreed to be part of it. Um, I tried to match up artists with subjects. So there's a brilliant essay about Felix Gonzalez Torres, and I found a brilliantly talented Cuban artist who is able to do that. So that was really exciting when you feel that the kind of cultures are matching up. Um, and yeah, it's just a brilliantly diverse roster. And some of the artists, there's one who's been illustrating for the Queer Bible since he was 15. And I found him, he lives in Mexico City, and I found him online. And he's super famous now, Fernando Monroy. And he's a brilliant young artist. And I've watched him grow. And it's just been such an honor to have him part of the book now. Um, but so yeah, we are a family. We're a family of writers. Um, and we're a family of illustrators. And so it's a little kind of like a queer, a queer factory, but all happening online. I would bet that if you haven't already, you will start having readers write in and giving you their kind of personal essays on, on their heroes. Has it already happened or, or uh, do you expect? Well, I actually, I, I decided to go with the publisher, um, Day Street Books and HarperCollins here in the UK, um, HQ, because the editor wrote me his personal essay about his hero and sent it to me. And that was why I was, I was like, whoa, this, this person really gets it. This, this company really gets it. My dream, especially through social media, people can be making their own videos, they can act queer Bible, and I will totally share them. I would love to hear from our, from our global audience about who their queer heroes are, and I will completely share them. Um, that's really exciting. And that's the beauty of social media and the internet. We can all kind of connect and continue to learn. So that's a very exciting prospect. Okay, one thing I did do was go through the entire book to see if RuPaul had contributed a hero wondered if you had actually asked RuPaul since you you know RuPaul was your hero to see if Ru would contribute would contribute one maybe in the future I RuPaul is definitely going to get a copy um with a very beggy fan letter from me <laughs> my dream would be RuPaul to be in it I think it almost would have been too much if I had written a really gushy essay about RuPaul and then RuPaul had been in it too so my dream is, is that RuPaul would uh, contribute to the next one. So if you're listening, Ru, let's make it happen. <laughs> you know, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the importance, and necessarily so, uh, on the importance of young people have, being inspired. But uh, even as we get older, um, how important is it to still have you know, new inspirations and, and new heroes? Hugely important. Hugely important, John. And I'm so inspired by the next generation. I am... Um, 
I see how politically active and brilliant they are and, and how open-minded they are about gender and identity and sexuality. I think the danger is, is for people my age to look at them and be like, oh, well, you know, we'll just leave global warming and all the political problems to them because they're so active. So we still need to have that fire and that drive to get out there and, and bring about political change. But when I look at kids today, I'm just so inspired by them. Uh, I'm so inspired by how hungry they are for knowledge, how politically aware they are, how generous they are. Like when I'm talking to them and I might ask them for advice about like different language and they're so generous and open and kind and really want to help. Um, and then also I think it's really good that if we in turn are learning from them, we can impart what, what knowledge we have and what stories we have. Um, and there'd be that kind of exchange through the generations. God, I'm making myself sound like a hundred years old, aren't I? A cultural exchange through the generations. <laughs> I, I think we all kind of do that though. Like even if you're 15 years old and you're talking about sexual orientation and gender identity, and that's because there's just so much, as you had mentioned, so much education and knowledge to share um, through our pain, our trauma and our oppression. So which brings me as we wind down to my, my biggest question of it all, you put this all together it made me want to hear more. And that's why I'm so grateful for the queer Bible and this community that you've created. Uh, but oftentimes we ask ourselves, what more can we do? We know that, you know, the work, there's a whole lot of work that we have to do, right? Like in America, after marriage equality, there are people still asking like, what's next? And it's like, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot that we still have to do. So the big question to you is, having hearing all these stories of how people had become their own activists or people had become advocates for others. It's like this lifelong thing that is a part of us as a queer person. You know, you just don't take the hat off. This is who we are. This is how we're going to live our life forever. What your thoughts are for, you know, the future of our movement, like what we need to be paying attention to. What are the youths saying? What are the elder saying what are we saying as far as the movement goes and what's important to us here in the united kingdom the vitriol of the press towards the trans community and the misinformation that i see on a daily basis and the abuse that i see my trans friends have to endure reminds me horribly of what i saw targeted at gay people in the 80s it's like the 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 target has just shifted from one part of our community to another and especially going back to what I was talking about before about how much the trans community have done for the gay community especially white gay men it's really now our turn to protect them and show up for them be that politically be that supporting them in whatever way that might be in, in amplifying their voices. Um, and I think that's the next thing challenge for, for especially white gay men to really make sure that they're showing up and not just kind of enjoying the rights that have been fought for by other people and then taking those very people for granted. Um, and the other thing I would say is, and this is something, you know, and I, I say all this, not as like someone that has all the answers, like I'm here to learn. I'm here to uh, uh, ask the questions as well. I, 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 I'm not a brilliant activist. I'm, I'm, I come to this just very humbly wanting to learn. And the other thing that I'm now trying to really engage with is about our global queer community and really putting my attention to them. And I would advise people, you know, on, online now that want to learn more organizations, as I said before, by like one of my contributors, um, Lady Phil, organizations like the Kaleidoscope Trust are really brilliant resources for how, showing how you can practically turn up and show up for our LGBTQ plus global family. So I think that's the next thing really, to be making sure that the rights we enjoy um, in our homes, in our home countries, are enjoyed by the rest of our family. And you know, it's, it's, it's an overused phrase, or maybe it's not overused, you can't use it enough because we're not all free until all of us are free. And I without sounding too earnest, I, that's something I really weighs on my heart. And it's something that I really want to focus on in the next part of my life and career. Last uh, July, I think it was, um, Michelle was the co-executive producer of this Global Pride online live stream for like 27 plus hours. 
it was it was amazing and it had contributions from pride organizations all around the world and probably some of the most moving parts of it were people from countries where literally you know they get could get a death sentence for being gay and being out and yet they were still you know putting themselves out publicly still you know advocating the cause still trying to you know show love at a time of, of uh, really often just in the, in the faces of incredible hatred. So um, yeah, I, 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 out of all that, I'm just saying, I, I re really appreciate that you've put kind of front and center on this, that yes, you know, things have happened great for, for a lot of LGBTQ folks, but um, especially for non-white cis folks, um, there's a lot that still needs help uh, that still can be done, needs to be addressed. And uh, in many cases, it's getting worse for some people. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Can I say, like, um, John and Michelle, like, thank you so much for the work that you do. Like, it's so important and it's so inspiring and moving hearing about projects like that. Like, really, it's 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 amazing. It makes me feel very connected to the global queer community. And it, it, yeah, thank you very much. And, and just a quick thing about that, too. Uh, Sir Elton John and David Furnish did bring us together. So see how we're all such a tight knit family because they specifically wanted to contribute to that project. And so at the very end, when we got to Hawaii at the like the 27th or 28th hour, we had a special message from David and Sir Elton and then a, they, you know, a permission to uh, also include a performance um, from yes and, and also permission to include a performance i'm choking up because i can't believe that we did that last year but here we are jack we're like family now and, and, oh, brother, Michelle, and we're it. like connected by all these great people whether it's their celebrities or their you and i they're we're people that really love and care about our community so thank you so much for being a part of us here at the commonwealth club and for sharing the queer bible with us and all of you please get your copy now. The Queer Bible, it's available wherever you can get a book these days. I personally think you should get a copy at your local bookstore, uh, right? And, um, but yeah, it's this beautiful sorbet looking, you know, cover. It's hot here in the Bay Area, Jack, right now. So I'm thinking about sorbet, <laughs> but it is beautiful. Uh, thanks so much again. Thank you for sharing the Queer Bible with us. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been lovely talking with you both. And John, tradition? Thank you again to our special guest on this Michelle Meow Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. Thanks to all of you watching or listening online. Please feel free to share this video with friends, family, and others in your network. And you can find more programs at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. So stay safe. Have a good rest of your week. <laughs>